My name is Ricky Spindler, and it is a privilege to be here, and I'm the lead pastor, and I just want you, uh, in a few moments, I'm going to tell you when, but I just want you to know, there is an enormous amount of work that goes in to shifting services. The amount of volunteers that were increased, just the, the different schedules, the routines, the amount of work that staff, elders, the worship team, the commitments that they're making to be here longer, adjusting their travel to get their kids here for services and stuff. So, man, I just, if you see somebody serving today, man, I just want you to say thank you, all that stuff. But can we give it up for all the people who are just serving us? Come on. Staff, different people. And it, it really is a privilege to be a part of what God's doing here. I want you, if you don't mind, we handed these out, and we, this will be the last week we do this for a season, these partnership cards. Uh, and even if you already know what it's all about, just make me feel good about myself and hold it in your hand, okay? And uh, we don't talk about membership here. We talk about partnership um, because we're all members of things that we no longer attend, a.k.a. the gym. Um, but I, I, we believe in partnership. It's the ethos behind what we, we talk about when we talk about membership. And we talk about um, partnering the Bible three primary ways is the Apostle Paul wrote about praying together, serving together, and giving together. It was his word in the scriptures that he expounded on, and those are the three primaries when, that he talked about it in the context of a church, praying, serving, and giving. Two times a year, we uh, talk about, uh, highlight this thing we call generosity kingdom builders and it really encompasses our tithes, our offerings, uh, which is above our tithes. Those are the two buckets. It's our umbrella term, kingdom builders. And we just highlight what we're doing locally uh, and globally um, here and around the world. And I just ask, prayerfully consider. We never manipulate, coerce. We do teach the principles of God's word. If you've never tried tithing from now until the end of the year, try it. Just experiment with it. If you can't give 10, give 5%. That's giving back to God through the local church. And I've just, it's a principle my wife and I have done since we were teenagers. And man, has it blessed our life. I mean, it's just amazing what it's, it's done for us. And then if that's, uh, you already tithe, and we just encourage you, would you th uh, think about giving to what we're doing locally and globally above the tithe? Just all the different things that we're a part of around the world. And we talked a lot about that list last week, so I won't go into that so much. But, um, but on uh, November the 10th, we receive, the second Sunday in November every year, we receive our miracle offering. We talk about it six weeks ahead of time. We ask people to prayerfully consider at the end of the year sowing into, in a significant way, uh, what God's doing through Stone Creek Church to our community, to the nations of the world. So all I ask is, if you want to scan the QR code, see, all, uh, download the booklet, the Kingdom Builders booklet. You got the videos of impact. You can see different things. Let's just all be praying and responding to what the Holy Spirit says as we move towards uh, the end of the year on November 10th. Can you get an amen on that? All right. Hey, I got two people clapping. All right. That was the resource director clapping right there. All right. And... Um, but all the different ways to give are going to be on the screen, just for those who would like to give today. Every week we show these. Just use the one that works for you if you'd like to participate in our, our giving today. I want to high, and I'll do this pretty much every week. I want to highlight two things today. Uh, actually, three. The first is Nigeria's Independence Day was this week on the 4th. Come on, can we? Nigeria. Got some Nigerians. Woo, hey, hey. Uh, secondly, is uh, we have broken ground on our community preschool in Kateta. And we have already uh, started building there. And we are going to begin the education process uh, in the Kateta school. That is the work that we do in Kenya, partnering with Pauline Bouvi, one of our elders, and her work there. And uh, so that's something significant that's starting. And then secondly, is have you seen some of the just the devastation of the flooding in North Carolina okay Asheville North Carolina and you're like thinking what can I do to be a part of that well you are a part of that if you give to Kingdom Builders because we have an organization that we support on on the ongoing basis called Convoy of Hope and they are already there they are given necessary um, all kinds of uh, clothing all kinds of uh, uh, toiletries all kinds of food you are there right now 
you're helping clear debris through your generosity. And so that's why it's so important to just be a part of what God's doing through the local church because I believe this, the local church is truly the hope of the world. It really is. And so today, I want to quote a verse to you. You know this verse before we get to John chapter 4. It's all moving towards something. And that's this. The Apostle Paul, speaking of partnership, gives a, 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 just a little uh, salutation, a little ending to his message to the Corinthian church. So he's written several chapters to the same church. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, but he ends 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14 with this. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. You're awesome. You're great. Just keep it going. We're good. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Just tell him, hey. Come on, hey, you're just lucky it's saying something good because that could be saying something bad. Okay, it's good. The grace of the Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Okay. <laughs> Amen. I got you. So, but uh, these are uh, really, it's a pathway of grace because grace is, it, it emanates, it flows from the love of God, the Father. It is... Um, Love in action, it moves towards us through the Son, God the Son. He is the picture of grace, the personification of grace. But it is personalized to us through the person of the Holy Spirit as we get this, as we fellowship with Him. Some translations use the word uh, commune with Him and communion with Him. That word, is, it, it means to travel together, to do life together to enter in and do business together. It really is the word that Paul uses, koinonia, as you koinonia with the Holy Spirit, as you partner with him, do business with him, travel with him, do life with him. That's when uh, life will have a new dimension and will, the title of the series, will have an overflowing aspect to it. It's amazing what happens when you partner with other people but it's even more amazing what happens when you partner with the Holy Spirit. That partnership really is the power source for all that is and all that God wants you to be and do. It's, it's, that relationship is really the synergistic relationship of your relationship with God. And what I'll say to this is I just a few weeks ago got off the phone with our church in Poltava, our, uh, the church we partner with Bread of Life. And they had a bomb from first time uh, fall about two to three kilometers away. Second time they were bombed, it was about 800 meters away, so less than half a mile. The windows were waving like this, he said, in the church. And so they're in the Ukraine, Russians dropping bombs, and they're projecting that Russia, listen, is going to knock out the power grid for the whole city. They're strategically going to attack the power plant that provides power to the whole city. And as they move into winter, they're going to be without power. So they're asking us, can you, can you help us buy a generator? Come on, somebody. So our kingdom builder's money is going to go help them do that. But here's what I noticed. The enemy wants to knock out their power source. And if I was the devil, I'm not, but if I was... I would try to knock out your power source. I would try to disrupt any communion, koinonia fellowship with you and the Holy Spirit. I would try to get in between that because if I can, if I can move you away from that, disrupt the rhythm of that, then your relationship in varying degrees will begin to be diminished of its power. And I want to look at, if I can, a story in the book of John that illustrates to us that koinonia, that fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to just kind of paraphrase this because of our time. I, it's a lengthy portion of Scripture. John was very verbose. If you want to read the gospel, that's quick. Read Mark. He gets it in and out quick. John takes too long. That's all I'm going to say. But that's my uh, critique. So John... 
chapter 4, he's writing about Jesus uh, going through a part of that region called Samaria. The Samaria, Samaria, Samaritans that lived in Samaria, they were, at that time, they were called half-breeds. That's what they called them. They were despised by the Jewish population because in Assyrian domination and being dispossessed around the world, they had married outside of the Jewish faith and Jewish uh, culture. Coming back, they were given a portion of land um, and they had congregated there. And the Jews at that time wouldn't go through Samaria. They would cross the Jordan River, go around it by several miles, and come back to the north of it. But this is interesting in John 4 because Jesus says an interesting phrase. He tells the disciples, I must go through Samaria. I love that Jesus lived his life with an I must. He is under divine direction. He says, I don't do anything unless the Father tells me to do it. I don't say anything unless the, Holy, uh, unless the Father tells me to say it. So Jesus is under divine direction. And Jesus goes to a city and sits on the edge of a well. And that well, we find out, is Jacob's well, which this was given uh, from Jacob to Joseph about a thousand years before. And the thing that makes this well so unique, it is a spring-fed well. It's a living well. And it had been watering that city and that region for about a thousand years uh, by the time Jesus shows up. And and Jesus sits down at the well. The disciples leave, and Jesus is sitting there waiting for a divine appointment. Now, in this moment, a, a woman comes. Now, think about all the people that are coming, but Jesus, the John highlights the story of a woman who comes, who we find out later has a, a loose lifestyle and is living with a man who's not her husband, but she's had a total of five husbands. And so she is coming at a time of day that, that is for the ill repute or whatever would have came at that time. But anyway, Jesus is waiting and begins to enter into her a, a, a conversation. I, I call this an intersection moment uh, where her life and his life intersect. And I call it the intersection of heaven and earth. If I go and I stand out on the intersection of race and Windsor, I am on race and I am on Windsor at the same time. I'm not, I'm not on, on um, it's not an either or, it's a both end. I am at the intersection of two things. So this is the intersection of heaven and earth. It is dirt and divinity combining at this moment. And she comes with a bucket, her watering pot. She comes to gather water. But she enters a conversation that begins with the question, Jesus says, hey, would you get me a drink of water? And her first question, she takes it to a conversation around race. I am a Samaritan. You're a Jew. Why are you talking to me? So, oh man, I could, I could preach a whole series out of this conversation that Jesus has with this woman right here. And he, he says, if you knew who I was, you'd be asking me for a drink of water. All right, he turns the tables and she goes, who are you? So she recognizes something a little bit different. He gets a word of knowledge. He reads her mail and says, you've had five husbands and the one you're living with is not your husband now. And she says, I perceive something different about you. <laughs> so here's what happens. Jesus responds to her question, where are you going to get this water? He offers you a drink and how, this is a deep well. Where, where's your bucket? How, wh wh what are you talking about? And verse 13 and 14 Jesus says this, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up, I like that, welling up to eternal life. Now, I'm going to give you just an, another portion of scripture, and that is... John 7, where Jesus uses the same metaphor in a different conversation, and he says these words in verse 38 through 39. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the Scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, 
whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not yet been given, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. And now may the Lord bless the reading of his word and truly give us understanding. So I want to talk to you about a bucket, a well, and a river. A bucket, a watering pot, a bucket, a well, and a river. I, this story, and when I think about a bucket, I will put this on the screen, I want you to think of it in, in three dimensions. A bucket is personal to me. Okay, it's my bucket that I bring to Jesus to satisfy my thirst. And it's personal, and it's Jesus moving towards me. It's to me. I call this the principle of the empty bucket. It is our emptiness that ultimately moves us towards Jesus. It's only when we realize at best we are an empty bucket that we will ask Jesus to fill our bucket. I love this. I heard somebody say this once that God sends away no one empty except those that are full of themselves. And we have these moments where we are designed by humanity with basic needs. And the, the thing that gets messed up is when we have a thirst that we seek to satisfy outside of God. We are all born thirsty. We all have to varying degrees different thirsts that we are seeking to be satisfied. It's in our emptiness, in our sickness, in our pain, in our vulnerabilities. Uh, that we are tempted to satisfy the thirst in a way that is not godly or godlike. So here's a, a woman, we don't know what her thirst was, but she's satisfying that through sexual ways. She's been in relationship after relationship after relationship, and she's drinking from those relationships in order to satisfy the, the a thirst in her soul. And I see this time and time again. I've even experienced this in my own life where I'm thirsty for something. My bucket is empty, and I try to satisfy that in a way that's not Jesus-oriented. Isaiah 8, 18 says an interesting thing. He says that we should seek the Lord, but if we do not seek the Lord, he's talking to the nation, you will be tempted to look to sorcerers, wizards, and witches. Here's what I take from that. You know, the Holy Spirit's not the only spirit you can drink from in this world. And if we're not drinking from the Spirit, that means that we are drinking from something else. And it's not always seemingly bad ways that we want to satisfy our thirst. Sometimes we can satisfy our need for approval through education and achievement. I think the big three are power, money, and sex often. We will seek to satisfy our thirsts through different means. Now, I was reading an article once about Roy Jones Jr. at the peak of his boxing prowess. And he said that whenever he entered the ring, they were at, what's the secret of your success? And he said, here's the deal. When I was young, my father was never there. He was largely absent. Had nothing to do with my life. So when I get in the ring, I just picture every opponent as the face of my father. Here he was by world standards, the, the, the world boxing champion, but every time he got into the ring, he was trying to satisfy his thirst through the achievement of the ring and winning. And he was on a, an endless um, conveyor belt, an endless treadmill of trying to satisfy the thirst of an absent father by the achievement in a ring. That's what I'm talking about. So she comes with an empty bucket and she's just wanting one drink of water. And Jesus says, I give you living water. That's to me. That's personal. That's my bucket. That's the beautiful thing. That's where salvation starts. I need you. Save me. Give me your peace, your joy. Fill my bucket. You know, you can be a Christian and have empty buckets. But the difference is you no longer seek to fill them outside of who Jesus is. That's the difference. Now, then it moves on. Jesus changes. He takes it one step further. He says, once you take a drink, what that drink's going to do in you, it's going to turn into a well. 
It's going to well up, and he says, on the inside of you and will become a spring of eternal life. So now Jesus says it starts with a bucket, Ooh, but it doesn't stop with a bucket. That's just the first drink. He says it will turn into a well and will expand on the inside of you. It's going to, I, that word literally means to leap up or it will jump up on the inside of you. It's going to spring up on the inside of you. Now, I, I, I just love this picture because it's the kingdom of God expanding on the inside of, of me. It's the kingdom of God growing on the inside of me. Now, what I would say to this, if this, is the, if this water, like Jesus said, is the, is the picture of the Holy Spirit, then, then that means this. is Watch this. That means that the Spirit's influence is expanding and filling me up on the inside of me. Here's what that means. The character of Jesus is growing and expanding in me. I, I call it the, in Galatians, Paul said, it's learning to walk in step with the Spirit. I, I, I grew up in, in the country, come on, and every year we'd have a festival and we'd climb a grease pole, we would do all kinds of fun stuff, but the one thing you did was the three-legged sack race. Have you ever seen those? Have you ever been in one of those? You had to pick your partner careful. Because you put one leg in the sack and you each had a leg out. But the secret was how well that third leg would roll together. Have you ever been a part of those where you get out of sorts with the third leg and then all of a sudden you're moving and boom, you're just on the ground and rolling? And the secret to the success was learning to swing that leg together, the third leg. I think that is... The kingdom of God expanding on the inside of you is learning to adjust to the leadership and the expanding influence as the water begins to spring up, well up, leap up, jump up on the inside of you. And what does that look like? That's the fruits of the Spirit. That's exactly what it is. It says that we would have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Every Sunday, I pray for the fruits of the Spirit over our church, that they would be evident in all people who call this church home. Because I don't want to lead with my attitude. I don't want to lead with my moods. You ever met a moody person? I don't want to lead with my fits. I don't want to lead with my anger, my preferences. I don't want to lead with my carnality. I want to lead and live under the growing, expanding influence. I took a drink, but I didn't know it was going to turn into a well. You know, salvation is only the beginning. That's when I get to be with Jesus. But now, as it expands and turns into a well, I get to be like Jesus. That's the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the third one. Is Jesus, in another conversation, he says, it starts with a bucket. It turns into a well, but then he says, then it will expand and turn into a river. It started with a little drink, then it turned up into a well, and then it turned into a river as the kingdom of God expanded. So the first one was to me, the second one was in me, and now the river is what God wants to do through me. The work of the Holy Spirit is three-dimensional. It's leading to an overflow, but it starts with what he's doing to me and towards me, then what he's doing in me, but ultimately it translates and transports into this, what he's ultimately going to do through me, because that well will start to spring up, and then it will flow out of you and turn into a river. It's the overflow life, the spirit of grace. You know what's interesting about that woman, one conversation, she leaves the well, doesn't even get the drink of real water, realizes he's the Messiah and goes back and brings, the scripture says, brought the whole village. And Jesus taught them that day, and many believed in him. It's amazing how quickly you take a drink, it can turn into a well and turn into a river. And, and I just think, when I think of a river, I think of a lot of different things. But let me, if I may, teach a little bit here. Because if the well is the fruits of the Spirit, then the river 
is the gifts of the Spirit. Now, listen, there are, in, within Christendom, there are categories. There are extremes. Uh, extremes would be this. There are those who would say it's all about the character of Christ and the fruits of the Spirit, and those who will say it's all about the gifts of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit. And I would just say both extremes are not healthy. But really think of them as two wings on a plane. In order to be on the plane, I need both of these things. I need the fruits of the Spirit, the character of Christ, and I need the charisms of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit. I need both of those things. I want to marry together fruit and gifts. I don't want to just be gifts and have no character. Come on. I don't want to just have fruits and have no power flowing through my life. And, and what, I, what I would say about that, too, is what I would include in that, when you think about the gifts, that's words of wisdom, that's prophecy, that's words of knowledge, that's the gift of faith, the gifts of miracles, the gift of healings, the discerning of spirits, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. That's Paul's list in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. But he marries it right through one of the fruits of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 13. It, the, the gifts rest upon the character of the fruits of the Spirit. Now, let me just say this. That also I would put there is the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the privilege, with the evidence of praying in spirit language, a language that I've never learned. And let me just say this. You can attend here and never pray in a heavenly language. It's getting quiet up in here now. You know... Um, I would never want anybody to be manipulated, coerced, or force anything on anybody. But I will teach the whole counsel of the Lord in the Scriptures. And we are not cessationists at Stone Creek. That does not mean that the Spirit ended when the book of Acts ended and the church ended. And when, when, the, when Revelation and John has his revelation, we believe that that was just the beginning. And the same power that birthed the church is the same power that we need today. That's what I believe. I mean, look around you. It ain't getting any better around here. And it's going to get much worse. And so I just think that when we talk about this, we will talk so with wisdom, decency, and order. But we're not going to leave out heavenly language. It's not a have to. You get to. And so you're going to hear us, especially next week, we're going to have our special guest, Sean Smith, who's going to be with us. We have an encounter night that's coming up. We do this every October with a different person that we bring in an outside guest to emphasize the person of the Holy Spirit. We'll have all of our service. Sean will be speaking. But that night from 6.30 to 8.30, for two hours, we're going to have worship with Christy Northup. We're going to have a moment where we linger and we teach on the person of the Holy Spirit in a way that we can't on a Sunday morning because of time. And then we're going to just spend probably a good amount of time lingering, worshiping, and waiting on the person of the Holy Spirit. And I'm just humbly asking you, would you consider being a part of that evening? We got preschool down for children's ministry, but we are going to linger in the presence of the Lord that night and give room for the bucket to turn into a well and the well to turn into a river. Amen? I'm going to close uh, with this, and I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up. You know, let's make sure... I got all my notes. Yep. So here's the thing. The bucket helps me be with, G with Jesus. The well helps me be like Jesus. But the river helps me do what Jesus did. Think about that. The bucket, I get to be with Jesus. The well helps me be like Jesus. But it's the river that helps me do what Jesus did. And... In 1763, there was a, a town that was created by French settlers about 30, 30 or so miles away from Natchez, Mississippi, right on the Mississippi River. They started a town that they called Little Gulf. It was started after the city of New Orleans. That was already a big city, but this was the expression of the Mississippi part of it. And they called that the Little Gulf. Well, it ended up being bought by a guy by the name of Thomas Calvert. 
He bought the town. Come on, that's some money back then. You bought a town. Yeah. And we'll just play in a second. Just, just, just hold off there for a second. But Thomas Calvert buys it. And he renames the town after his mentor, one of his mentors. And the town's name became Rodney. Named it after one of his mentors named Rodney. And that town, believe it or not, became the most prosperous town in the state of Mississippi. And over the decades, it had the largest population. And when they voted on a state capital, it only lost by three votes to Jackson, Mississippi. Right. It only lost by three votes. It had towns. It had restaurants. It, it had, I mean, everything that you could think of that led to prosperity. It was the major port in Mississippi on the Mississippi River until something happened. Over, over the decades, almost imperceptibly, there upstream was a sandbar that over time was collecting sand and soot and debris, so much so that over the decades, it shifted the Mississippi River. It shifted the Mississippi River varying degrees over a period of time three miles to the east of Rodney, Mississippi. And it shifted complete three mile, almost two to three miles away. If you were to go to Rodney, Mississippi today, there's nobody living there. In 1963, I think it was, the governor declared it no longer a town. The buildings are still there to some degree. In fact, um, the, the biggest building is a Presbyterian church with the roof caving in. And, and uh, what happened is their prosperity, watch this, was linked to the river. And they had a decision when the river moved, they could have moved. But they decided to stay where they were instead of moving to where the river was. You know, when I heard that story, I said, like, that'll preach. I can turn that into a sermon right there. You know, guys, I just would say our prosperity as Christ followers is connected to our ability to stay near the river. And any time an individual does not plant themselves, Psalms 1, by the streams of living water, you know what happens? They dry up, they wilt. And a church, if it does not flow with the Spirit, and it does not stay connected to the river, it will lose its prosperity. Souls will not be saved. People will not be set free. Generosity will dry up because the, the life of the river is not there. And as a church, I just want to be honest, as a pastor, I'm committed personally and corporately. Let's stay connected to the river. Let's, let's fill our buckets. Let's be a well. And let's be a river to the nations of the world. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's all stand. Now, come on. Now you play. That's good. Let's all stand. That's great. We got just a few minutes left. And let's put our hands out in front of us, palms up before the Lord. And just create. If you can't stand, stand. If not, no big deal. But if you can, let's put your hands out in front of you, palms up, in a posture of humility to receive. I just want you to bow your heads, close your eyes. Where this is your moment to respond to the message. Let's start first with, if you're here and you need to be born again, you need to be saved. Your bucket's empty, and you've never filled it with living water. You've sought to satisfy it in a lot of ways. But this is a moment in time of divine intersection right now. This is when heaven and earth dirt and divinity. Your life and the life of Jesus intersect. And if you'd say, hey, I need my bucket filled. I need to be born again. I need to be saved. Like this woman, I need to drink from that. If you're here and you need that, just ask Jesus to save you, to fill your, your bucket, to be born again, to live a life under the control of the Spirit. And as you're doing that, Let's now move to those who are already in Christ. 
Well, just in your own words right there, would you just pray and would you just begin to say, I welcome you, Holy Spirit. I welcome you. I enter into the presence of the Lord. Come on, with your words. Why don't you just say that I fellowship, I partner with you, Holy Spirit, right now. I'm partnering with you. Let's do this together, Holy Spirit, you and me. And I just want you to picture right now, you got a bucket in those hands. Would you do it? And you may have an emptiness that you're feeling right now. You, you can't solve that issue, that situation on your own. You need living water to fill that bucket. Would you just, as you hold your hands out, and just say, Holy Spirit, I put my bucket before you. And just ask him, Christian, one more time, to fill the bucket. Come on, if there's an area of need that you need to turn to him, where you need his help, he helps us in our weaknesses. Would you just pray along those lines right now? Help me in my thinking. Help me in my healing, Lord. Help me in my decision. Fill my bucket. Would you do that? That's good. It's not wrong to have an empty bucket. That's a good place. Fill me up, Lord. Now, would you say, Lord, now let that bucket turn into a well. Come on. I ask the Holy Spirit, make me into a fountain of life. Spring up within me. And would you ask now for the character, the fruit of the Spirit? Would you do that? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. I want to walk in step with you, Holy Spirit. That's it. Let me be in at your pace, walking with you. Not ahead of you, behind you, but with you. And now, thirdly, come on, just ask, ask for a river. Would you do that? To flow out of you. That the kingdom of God would expand from within you to outside of you. And if you're willing and you want to, just say, Lord, let the gifts of the Holy Spirit be operation in me. Baptize me fresh and anew with the Holy Spirit's power. And Lord, let it be a river that flows with me. I plant myself by the river. Father, I just thank you that the Holy Spirit is active, it's working. You're filling buckets. You're letting new things spring up, the character of Christ. And you're, there's a river flowing out of us in this room. Lord, may we always move with the river, the flow of the Holy Spirit, the current of the Holy Spirit. Let us prosper as we plant ourselves near you. You said you'd bless the work of our hands. Our fruit would not wither. Our leaf wouldn't wither. Whatever we did would prosper, you said, if we would plant by the river. So, Lord, we plant by the living water. We thank you, Lord. Come. In Jesus' name, amen.